Kings chapter 13. And I'm going to preach this uh, afternoon on lessons from the book of King, book of 1 Kings, the lying prophet. You know, often we uh, we read in the Old Testament different passages and uh, we see things we don't understand and we don't make applications to them. But uh, what we're going to study this afternoon is a very important lesson. We need to stand for the Word of God regardless of who tells us otherwise. Even if an angel comes from heaven and takes the Word of God and tries to turn you away, you should not follow, even an angel. And we're going to learn about this man in 1 Kings 13, the great prophet who was faithful to God. And he had passed several tests where he remained true. But then the lying prophet, excuse me, <coughs> I'm still having problems with this tooth I had cut out last Friday and uh, give me a lot of pain and drainage and stuff so remember me in prayer so the man of God uh, he was true to the test he faced until the last one and uh, the lying prophet came to him and said now God spoke to me and God told me this, and it was directly opposed to what God had told the prophet in the beginning. And because it was a so-called man of God who was older than him, he believed a lie. And he went home with him, and while they were eating, <clears throat> the lying prophet said, before you... Uh, leave the house and head out, there's going to be a lion that's going to kill you because you didn't obey God. He's the one that lied to him and, and told him all these things and got him to his house. And then after he had disobeyed God, the lying prophet who had led him to be deceived announced, now you're going to die. A lot of times things don't work out the way we think. And sometimes things are not fair. Uh, but God has a sovereign purpose. And there was a lesson in this for us in that we should never, ever be turned from the truth, regardless of who it is, whether it's a grandchild or a, a wife or a husband, an aunt, whatever it may be, always remain true to the Word of God regardless. Now let's begin in verse 1. Behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Now remember that Jeroboam was the son of Nebat, and he caused Israel to sin. And he set up these places of worship that were not authorized by God. And he changed the offerings and the recipient of the offering to other gods. And he began to lead the people away from God and away from truth and into error. Now the Lord sent this prophet. He's called a man of God a number of times, and I believe he was. And he came to Bethel, and there was Jeroboam by the altar, and he was evidently burning incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. So he's prophesying, the coming of Josiah, and God's going to raise him up, and upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee 
and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Now remember the message was directly to the altar. Jeroboam was there who was a great compromiser. And even though he had a father of great renown, he was a compromiser. He's one of these guys that they don't care what the truth is. They're out to get a big crowd and a big following and a big name and they'll compromise whatever God has said in order for the profitability of their gain. Now, we hate to say that, but it's true. And uh, we should always be aware of how that can affect us. The Bible says he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is a sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. I see Jeroboam thought he was a big man, big man, tough, you know. What are you doing prophesying against my altar and what I'm doing? I'm going to reach my hand out and lay it on you. I'm going to hurt you. And so he reached out his hand to lay hold on the prophet, and all of a sudden that hand just swiveled up like a prune. And he couldn't even move it. I mean, God just struck him like that. And so uh, the Bible says his hand that he put forth dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. He stuck it out and it just dried up and he couldn't move it back. Now that ought to be enough to wake you up. I mean, if something like that happened to one of us, I'd be saying, Lord, what am I doing wrong? You know, if, if uh, God did something like that, it was an attention getter. The altar also was rent, the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So it was a true prophet, man of God. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. It's amazing how one moment he's ready to punch him out or choke his neck, and then when he's suffering this consequence, oh, pray for me and help me now. I need help. Pray for my arm that it's not withered up like this. And uh, I'm sure the man of God probably thought what you really need is maybe a good slapping, but... He didn't do that. The man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before. So what a miraculous thing that happened there. You know, the Bible tells us to pray for our enemies. And the Bible tells us to love those that would persecute us and do all manner of evil against us for Christ's sake. And uh, it's not always easy to do it. I listened to a, a court case where a, a man had killed this couple's daughter. She was only like 15, and he had brutally raped her and murdered her. And they were in the court, and uh, this guy that did this kept looking at her father and grinning, you know, and, and saying little things to uh, cause him to just, I mean, and finally he just had enough. And he made a dive about four rows over everybody in the courthouse to get a hold of him. And I guess if he had got him, he'd have probably killed him. But, uh, you know, a little bit later they talked to him and he said, well, I did wrong. But he said, I just could, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't take it anymore. And I, I don't know that I could. You know, I don't know if somebody had done that to my daughter. I would pray that I would have a forgiving attitude, but my first response may be, whew, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. The Bible says, The king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I'll give thee a reward. 
Okay. What are you going to give me? Gold? Silver? What kind of reward? The man of God said to the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. Look at the resolve he has. I mean, God has told him, you go down and deliver the message. We don't have the time to read chapter 12, but you ought to read that so you can understand fully the context. But uh, the, the, the man wants him to go home, Jeroboam or whoever it may have been, and he says, I will not do it. If you give me half your house, I wouldn't go home and eat with you. Verse 10, So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came, to Bethel. So he goes a totally different direction. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. He's a prophet, but we don't know what kind of prophet he is. We don't know how much love he has for God and how much he really walks with the Lord. I tell you, uh, I learned long ago, you don't know, you don't know even a Baptist preacher until you get to know him and you live with him and be around him and find out what kind of life he really lives. There are a lot of men are nothing but hypocrites. Yeah. And they go home and they, they do terrible things to their wife and their children and they do not lead the kind of life that is honoring to God. So now we see that <clears throat> when they tell their father all that's happened, their father said to them, what way, what way went he? For his sons had seen that way the man of God went, which came from Judah. He said unto his sons, saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. He went after the man of God, found him sitting under an oak. He said unto him, Art thou the man of God? Came from Judah? He said, I am. So he heard, this man of God heard what his son said. He got on a donkey and he caught him and he was under an oak tree. It's, it's normally very hot in that part of the world. And during the summertime, temperatures can get 110 112, and so he probably was tired, hasn't eaten anything, hasn't drank anything. And you know how our flesh is. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we've all experienced that. We, we've probably had resolve at times, and then we get tempted, and we stand strong, but then we get tempted again, again, and then before you know it, you give over. Well, the Bible says, verse 15, Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also, uh -huh. as thou art. I'm just like you. I'm a man of God too. Oh, really? Oftentimes I hear people, you know, they'll say, well, I'm a preacher too. And you get to talking to them about, well, uh, when did you get saved? Uh, tell me about your life. What kind of education do you have? How long have you studied the Word of God? What kind of family do you have? You get to talking about people and you find out real quick they're not like you. They're not faithful to God and honorable to God the way they ought to be. Now I'm not saying that, that I'm perfect or I'm anything but a sinner saved by grace. But God's changed my life, and I, I know He's the one who's done it. And when you get around someone who pretends, it's not too long before you find out. 
I used to tell all of our missionaries we, we would play golf once a month. And I told them I, I learned more about missionaries playing golf with them for one day than most people would learn in five years. I learned what they say when they shank a shot or they, you know, hit a big duck hook or, you know, I've seen Baptist preachers take golf clubs and throw them a uh, hundred yards into trees. I've even heard a few say some words that uh, weren't very becoming to a Christian, not to uh, speak of a pastor. But uh, anyway, he said, I'm like you. And he said, uh, uh, the prophet, the man of God said to him, uh, I may not return. He gives him what God's word says. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt not eat nor drink. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me. Wow. Yeah, I'm not only like you and I'm not only a prophet, but there was an angel that spoke to me and visited with me. Let me tell you something. All angels are not God's angels. There are fallen angels called demons. And they are absolutely real. And if you've never experienced it, I don't wish it on you. But uh, I've had some experiences where I know that there are demons. And I've had them to attack. And when they do... It's, it's just about overwhelming to see. And so he says, An angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. Notice, but he lied unto him. He lied. You say, well, why would he do that? I don't really know except that Evidently, he was under some evil influence. And uh, this man who claimed that he was a man of God proved that he was not a man of God. He goes on and verse 19 says, So he went back with him. <clears throat> what happened to that resolve? Mm -hmm. What happened to the man that had spoken twice and said no? God has given me His Word, and I can't do this. And suddenly, he's about like a mud turtle, just flips over on its back and gives up. And the Bible says he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and did drink water. And came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. Now that's the lying prophet. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandments which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread, and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, drink no water, thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy father. And it came to pass after he had eaten and drank that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way, slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way. And the ass stood by it, the lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. What a sad turn of events. Jeroboam had sought to seize the man. And God had swiveled his hand and then, by the prayer of the real man of God, he had been cured. The king asked the man of God to pray for him, and he did. All of the things we see about this true man of God seem to point out that he was an authentic man of God. 
that he was real, that he loved God, and that he was doing his very best to keep the word. The man of God was careful to keep God's threefold command. I believe if, if we carefully let this weigh on our hearts as it ought, it's a reminder to all of us that <clears throat> when God speaks, and especially when we have the written word of God, when God speaks, His word means something. And it means that we should obey it and follow it to the very best of our ability. Because God will not take lightly comp <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Compromise and disobedience in his name. He will drop the hammer. And we may think, oh, you know, we can have our women talk out loud and preach in the church and we'll have them lead in prayer and do all this. I was uh, watching a program about the uh, United Med. Methodist, and uh, like 12, 15 years ago, they began to uh, ordain women preachers. And uh, just a short time ago, they ordained homosexuals and lesbians. So that's the way compromise is. Call on your wife to pray out loud over the men. And you think, oh, that's, that's nothing. I want to tell you it's something. Because you're setting a precedence. And then if your wife does not have enough wisdom to know that this, whatever, whether it be her husband or whatever, that says this is fine, and she doesn't understand the difference, there's something wrong in her heart. Because the Bible clearly teaches us that this should not be something that women do in the assembly. And we could talk about scriptural baptism. We could talk about the Lord's Supper being closed communion. We could talk about those that are practicing open communion, alien baptism. They'll take members any way they can get them. <clears throat> so it'll build their numbers, build their, their paycheck and their pride. And all of that. God will hold you accountable. I had a young preacher friend years ago when he first began to pastor, he called me and told me that time we were very close and he said, Pastor, he said, what do you think about uh, when someone comes forward in the church uh, that instead of letting the church vote on it, you just do it yourself as the pastor? I said, no, 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 no. You're, you're, you're avoiding the church instead of having church authority, and you're allowing pastoral authority to precede the church. I said, you're wrong. You shouldn't do that. Well, he did it anyway. When somebody would come, and maybe they were Campbellites or Methodist or whatever, he would go ahead and accept their baptism and didn't bring it before the church. He just... Take them himself. Now, I've got a problem with, with anybody that would do such a thing because of the honor of God and for that person's good. If we take alien baptism as if it's right, then uh, God's going to hold us accountable. If we uh, do not honor Him and his, his Word and His commandments... Uh, we're going to have to pay the price for disobedience. This man of God had been very careful in the beginning. You remember Paul wrote to the Galatians and he, he said, uh, what, what has hindered you, Galatians? You, you began so well, but are you now made perfect in the flesh? They began in the grace of God, but then as time went on, they began to compromise and the church began to uh, receive works for salvation instead of salvation by grace. 
He ate nothing, he drank nothing, and he began to walk a different way home. I mean, it seems like he's doing everything right. But an older prophet, saying, I also am a prophet, and an angel spoke to me by the word of God, said, come back with me, come to my house. And earlier the prophet had told the other man, he said, I don't care if you give me half your house. I wouldn't come back and eat with you or drink with you. But now, this guy's not offering him anything. In verse 18, the Bible says, uh, He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Remember, Paul was dealing with the gospel, and he said, If any man preach any other gospel than that which I have preached unto you, let him be anathema. And he went on to say that even if an angel comes to you and tries to lure you away from truth, don't believe it for one second. Don't fall prey. So the man fell prey to his lies, ate bread, drank in his house, and this lion met him on the road and killed him. You, you just imagine what that old prophet was thinking. You know, I was so faithful to the Lord. Lord, I, I'm sorry. I didn't know that this man was a liar. I didn't know that what I was doing was wrong while that big six, seven hundred pound lion just put its teeth over his head, chomped down, broke his neck, and just killed him. I imagine he had a lot of remorse in the moments before he died, thinking, Lord, why am I dying like this? A prophet of God, a true man of God who was lied to. You know, we face this all the time. You go to a Bible conference and you know certain ones think they're a big shot and uh, people will talk to you and tell you to do this and do that. But I've learned that you're the one that's going to answer to God and you're the one that's going to say to the Lord whether you did this for whatever reason and if we're disobedient it's going to be us. Who are going to answer? The prophet lied. He buried the man of God in his own grave, instructed his sons to, upon his death, bury him beside the man of God. And doing these things, the old prophet showed his sincere belief that this man who died had been a true man of God. His prophecies against the idolaters of Israel would all come true. Look at uh, 1 Kings 13, 31. And came to pass after he had buried him that he spake to his son, saying, what I, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. After this thing Jeroboam returned not from his evil way but made again of the lowest of the people priest of the high places whosoever would be consecrated he consecrated him and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from off the face of the earth. This, this prophet who had been called to do this was a real man, a real man of God. And after this thing, Jeroboam did not turn from his sins, but he continued to disobey God and to take the lowest and vilest men and make them priests unto God. 
So we have a prophet who lied, and we have a prophet who died. In this account, we see that both the godly and the ungodly face consequences for disobedience to the Lord. The evil king faced judgment because of his idolatry, and the man of God likewise faced judgment for his disobedience. No one is above the laws of God. I remember a number of years ago, Jimmy Swaggart, who was worldwide in his fame, was caught with a prostitute and evidently had been doing this a number of times, thinking it was okay, he'd get away with this. And then just uh, several months ago, Ravi Zacharias, who I had a lot of respect for at the time, I had no idea that the man was living a double life. He was going to spas and having relationships with girls as young as 13. And he was saying that God was using her to be a blessing to him while he was committing fornication and adultery with these young girls. His life was a total farce after it came out what he was doing. Why is it that people of God who are walking close to God think that they can do something like that and just get away with it. That God won't hold them in check. He wouldn't be God if He let you get away with that kind of stuff. And we're all prone. We can all fall prey to Satan's lies and temptations. But this is a double warning to us. You want to walk with God? Do justly. Love mercy and walk humbly with thy God. And when the devil tries to tempt you into adultery or some lady kind of flirts with you and you can tell that she's, you know, making a move, you have to be strong enough to say, I've got my wife, I love her more than anything, and I will not. I have prayed, and I have prayed with all my heart, Lord, if I would ever even consider committing adultery on my wife, kill me, Lord. Kill me before I do it. And I'm that serious about it. Because the devil is constantly trying to maneuver in ways to get us to compromise our faith, our morals, what we believe, we're in a constant battle. One man lied, one man died, and we see both godly and ungodly face consequences for disobedience. We also see that sometimes temptation comes from surprising quarters. Amen. One of the things that, that I have seen in, in the years is where temptations sometimes come from from places that would be, you would think it would never come from that. That's right. But it does. And it catches you in a moment where you think, what is going on? But it's the hand of Satan. When a person like the prophet is tempted to sin, we should not give in. We should not let down our guard. Remember one of the things that Paul repeatedly expresses is we are to live soberly and righteously. And every time that temptation comes, we're to look it squarely in the eyes and with the grace of God, rebel and turn from that sin. Remember what happened to Joseph when Potiphar's wife, and no doubt she was a beautiful woman, she had all of the beautiful makeup and all the things to make her gorgeous. And when she wanted to lie with Joseph, the Bible says he ran from her. He knew that if he stayed around, 
she was going to get him into a position that was not right. And she grabbed his, his uh, garment and then tried to say that he tried to do something to her when she was the one behind all of it. You see, when God speaks, the matter is settled. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. There's never an excuse for disobeying God's word. A fellow believer, even an angel coming from heaven, cannot nullify the words of the living God. I'd like to read you in closing this one last thought that came to my heart. The book of Galatians, chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 8. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. But though we, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> sorry, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. The eternal word of God is settled in heaven. And you know, one of the hardest things that we do when we deal, when we sin, is that we disobey our Father and it displeases Him. Amen. He wants us to obey Him and to live a pure life. I told Kathy not too long ago, I, I was out in Irvine and there was uh, three young people come up to me and, oh, Brother Tony, we haven't seen you in so long. And they were saying, oh, we just loved it when you were our pastor and how you led us in youth and all the things you did. <coughs> Excuse me. And I tell you, it just touched my heart. And I said, Lord, thank you that I never did anything in front of those children except love them and help them. So many pastors have to hide from their life because of sexual abuse and things that they have done to young people. Such a sad, sad testimony. I'm so glad for the people that I meet that I've been their pastor and the love they show me. And I know it's all by grace. Amen. Thank God for His grace to help us be pure and holy, loving, faithful in all our ways. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for this opportunity to worship You, Lord. Take this word and apply it to our hearts. Lord, I know I need this. And I know the people here need your word in their lives. Help us, Lord, to walk with you and give us grace to be true until the end of our lives. And then when our life ends, that we can say, Lord, I've tried to do everything I can to walk with you and obey you. And I pray you'd forgive us, Lord, of our sins, iniquities, and transgressions, and purify our hearts in the blood of the precious Lamb of God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Let's stand, Brother Philip, Kat. If there's anybody here that doesn't know the Lord, the Lord Jesus died, he was buried and raised from the dead to save sinners.